It is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Jeffrey Brown all the way from Falls Church, Virginia, about 10 minutes from Washington, D.C. He graduated from Georgetown Dental in 1986 and built a large practice shortly thereafter. He's been working in the area of TMJ disorders for over 25 years and took over the practice of Dr. Brendan Stack about five years ago. He has lectured on TMJ disorders in London, Dubai, Seoul, Washington, D.C., and Oslo. He currently teaches is TMJ and sleep treatment modalities in Toronto. He is very experienced in identifying cranial bone distortions and how they relate to the various disorders including migraines, sleep disorder breathing, and even movement disorders like Tourette's. Um, you know, I'm so honored to have you come on the show because I just, this is Dentistry Uncensored. Let, let's start with the uncensored part. It seems okay. like the, the only thing pediatric dentists argue over is like silver diamine fluoride. I, I still don't know what endodontists argue about. They all seem to be on the same page. But, man, when it comes to TMJ, there is more different camps. There's neuromuscular. What, um, t- so okay. t- TMJ is a lot more uh, confusing to the young dentist because they hear one guy say neuromuscular and they say another guy, no, you got to do Dawson, Panky, CR. Um, yes. Um, so, so shed some light on TMJ for all of our homies today. Okay, I've been through it all, Howard. Uh, I was, or I guess I am, a neuromuscular dentist from way back, the LVI training. However, I learned after about a year or so that it didn't work for me, at least. I started studying how cranial bones, if the cranial bones are distorted like this, like if a person's ears are like this, the eyes are like this, the cranial bones internally are all distorted. So I really kind of felt like pulsing and tensing the muscles wouldn't make any difference because you're just simply pulsing to an unstable cranial foundation. It's kind of like if you renovate the kitchen in your beach house, yet the beach house, the stilts are like this, the house is tipped this way, you're going to renovate the kitchen internally and kind of make it like this, but it won't be level with the rest of the house. So that's my theory on it. I know there's a lot of guys and gals that argue neuromuscular is a next best thing compared to white bread. However, I learned over the years of my osteopath and physical therapy training that I think there's a little better ways to do things. But you're right, there's a, it's terribly contentious out there that we argue all the time about how TMJ treatment should be, should be done. And um, I guess because of Brendan, I do an MRI on every single patient that walks in my door. Yes, sir, an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging of the articular discs in the joints. Well, let, let, me, then, let, let me interrupt yeah. you right there. Why, sure. um, um, it seems like most people are using a, C, a cone beam technology in their office um, because an MRI is a large machine. Why, so you're, you think it's better to treat TMJ, TMD, sending them out for an MRI because you wanna see soft tissue as much as hard tissue? I most certainly do. And I also get a CBCT of the TM joints when the patient comes back in and various other x-rays to look at the bones, condylar shape and positioning. I check condylar angulation relative to the central axis. But if you don't look at the disc, if you don't know where that disc is, you've lost another measure of how the patient is doing. Because a follow-up MRI a year down the road will tell you if you're on the right path. So I do the, I like to do the whole gamut, MRI for soft tissue, CBCT of the condyles, then three other standard orthodontic films. And then I have a really good picture and I can track and progress with the patient. A lot of the patients want to measure how they're doing. They want measurable quantities. This is how you give it to them. I, I, I want to read more of your bio because I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a huge fan of yours. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brown grew up in the state of Maine and went to Bowdoin College where he graduated magna cum laude in 82. He accepted early decision into the Georgetown School of Dentistry and graduated from there in 86. While at Georgetown, Dr. Brown worked in the neurology department as an assistant on a project that involved studying the regeneration of nerve tissue in the spinal column after major trauma. Upon graduation from Georgetown Dental School, Dr. Brown worked for a short time as associate in the practice 
in Falls Church, Virginia. From there, he moved on, built his own practice in the Farlington neighborhood in Arlington, Virginia, creating one of the largest practices ever seen on the East Coast. Dr. Brown took a short sabbatical to help raise his four young children and to continue his education. It was then he began the process of understanding sleep apnea and how it correlates to TMJ treatment. His knowledge of the combined fields of TMJ, sleep, and orthodontics has given him a perspective unlike most other practitioners who perform basic dentistry. In addition, Dr. Brown has also learned the advanced techniques involved in expanding an airway so that both children and adults can breathe better. His training continued over time at the famous Sleep Medicine Center near the Emory University Hospital. He has also continued his training with the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain and the ALF Education Institute. In 2013, Dr. Brown met Dr. Brennan Stack and was immediately mm -hmm. impressed with the success Dr. Stack had in treating TMJ cases and being able to repair so many damaged lives. For Dr. Brown, helping people by dealing with the debilitating TMJ issues became a second calling, and, and they say the rest is history. Um, the 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 only red flag in this bio is you went to Georgetown and you worked in Emory, and then they closed both of those dental schools down. Do other dental yeah, schools uh -huh. say, "Hey, don't come work here"? Every time you're in a dental school, it goes under, it goes down. <laughs> well, that's a possibility, Howard. Yeah, but also back then, I had hair on my head and I rode a motorcycle too. So things have changed a lot since then. <laughs> so so um. So what 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 do you what do you think these kids need to know? Because they're going to come out of school. They say, I, I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, Doctor Brown, I graduated four hundred thousand dollars in student loans. So we, I, I feel like we hardly learned anything in TMJ and inclusion. What 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 advice? What pearls would you give them on their journey to learn TMJ, occlusion, sleep apnea, how they're related? It is a long journey, Howard. It's a very tough one. I had a, a doctor from Toronto called me a couple of years ago, fresh out of school, said, oh, I see what you do. I want to do what you do. I love what you do. And I said, what's your training? Have you, have you become disgruntled? Have you learned that everything they teach you out there is pretty much questionable? I said, if you're not an unhappy dentist and you've been everywhere, and I'm talking Panky Dawson, LVI, you've done it all, I've seen everything, hundreds of hours of orthodontic training, if you haven't done that and become a little bit disgruntled and questioning things, then there's nothing we have in common yet. In other words, I tell the young person, you need a lot more experience in, in failures to get where I'm at, to get, I guess you have to be a little disappointed in the way things are being taught. And then you learn from guys like Brendan. Brendan was brilliant. He, if you, I'm sure you knew Brendan. He, um, we met six years ago after, and I did meet him, by the way, 15, 20 years ago and said, hey, I want to buy your practice and all this. He told me where to put it and what to do with it. That was Brendan for you. Then we hooked up again six years back and he says, I think I'm ready at this point in time. And he was, I thought I knew a lot of stuff. I really did. I thought I was really top notch with the field of TMD. I was, uh, when I met Brendan, he beat me down to the ground basically with my knowledge base. I didn't know much of anything I found out. And these past six years have been an eye opener. Now he is retired at this point, but he pushed me along that journey very hard at the beginning. And uh, I'll have to admit, I, I learned one hell of a lot from that man. If you have him come on in the next week, we'll release uh, you then followed by him. Okay. Yeah, we can try to arrange it. Brandon just had a, uh, a, medical procedure so i'll have to see if he can get out and around okay yeah if not uh, or yeah um so so talk about your expertise in the area of tmjd um you have over 500 hours of training in the amazing alf appliance your practice limited to tmj disorders <clears throat> you treat migraines tourettes tremors add ocd dystonia and understand the connection between displaced articular disc and these disorders. And you claim an 80 to 90% uh, chance of improving their lives greatly. Oh, yeah, tremendously so. My team thinks we're above 90%. However, I call it 80%, so we're somewhere in the middle there. Um, we are able to treat the TMJ slip discs. And by getting those displaced discs back on top of the condyle where they belong, you abate so many of the symptoms. And my experience has been so far, for example, Tourette's. We see a lot of Tourette's patients, whether that's fortunate or unfortunate. We're able to help with, I think we're down around 80% with those people. We're 90% or higher with migraines, but the Tourette's patients are the interesting ones that we have a lot of people fly in from all over the world to see me for Tourette's treatment. The problem is we're not treating Tourette's. We're treating the TMJ disorder 
And I want to be really clear about that. And so far, Howard, in 100% of my cases, the articular discs are tipped medially in Tourette's patients. Now, that's something very astounding, I think. Brendan and I argued on this for many years as far as, should we write a paper about this? Should we talk about more about this? But every single Tourette's patient I've ever met has medially slipped discs. And to me, that's fascinating and astounding information because there's no, no one really has a handle on this yet. They all say Tourette's is a genetic disorder, maybe a developmental disorder. They really don't know. Then they put all sorts of labels on it saying it has to be present for a year and all these little ticks have to be present. But to me, it's just medially tipped discs. Wow. And how do you treat it? With various appliances. Now, the MRI is the key factor here. If the medially slipped discs are lodged and do not reduce, they're stuck, then I use a lower gelb appliance to take the pressure off. I flat plane it to get mobility of the maxilla. Upper ALF, the ALF is the key thing too. The ALF will begin the process of leveling the cranial bones, which are always distorted in these patients, every single time, 100%. It's it's a wild disease, Tourette's. There's 200,000 cases a year in the United States. It's rare in females. It's mostly in males, and it starts... um, about age six, and then it's kind of gone by 40. Why, why do you think it's in males between age six and 40? Well, because age six is when the first molars start to come in. That's when you have major changes to the, the jawbone structure itself. Things are really moving around a lot. And if there's a predisposition with that slip disc, it's going to aggravate it even more. Males over females, I don't know exactly why. I'm thinking males develop a lot faster at that age maybe but i i don't know i don't know a lot about the developmental aspects at that age just that the six-year molars do come in and and it really doesn't go away it's just more that as you get older you learn to deal with it we just finished with a 40 year old male who i worked with jack and i can say his name because he gave permission but we worked with jack for about a year and he has terrible tics when he first came to my office, he sat in our dental chair, and you know how big those dental chairs are, Howard, those are heavy duty devices. He did this, and he broke my damn dental chair. He broke the rod or shaft down at the bottom because his tics were so violent. He actually, when you walk up to the guy, he scares you when you have a tic, and when he has a tick like that, you jump back because you're in fear. Well, we worked with him, got him 60% better, then discuss the surgical option of going in and placating the discs back on top of the condyles. He did that, and a month later comes in, the ticks were still there. We still had hopes, and the funny thing is six months later, he calls up and says the ticks are 95% gone. He was all better. He actually joined his son's softball team and became their coach because this is the first time in 40 years he could actually walk out the door and not be embarrassed by his behavior. That was a win. And how did, how did you treat it? Well, I treated it with the, the Gelb style appliance on the lower, ALF on the upper, osteopath work to realign the cervical spine. His whole body was worked upon and realigned. And then came a tragic call at about seven months in. I was driving to West Virginia to go to uh, um, Jay Gerber's classes, the famous orthodontic training program. I'm halfway through out in the mountains, and and Jack calls me up and says, Hey, Jeff, man, I need to tell you something. His little dog was attacked by two, like, almost mastiff-type things. He intervened, laid on the ground, protected his dog. The two dogs attacked him. They tore his ear off the side of his head, cut open his jaw, ripped open his shoulder. And Jack called me back and said, Hey, Doc, you know, the ticks are all back again because they tore the ear off. And... Now he's got the ticks back all over again. It was, if you ever wanted proof positive that the displaced discs caused the Tourette's, there it is right there. Tourette's, um, what, um, so tell me more about this ALF appliance. Okay, what the ALF does, Howard, it's, it's a little device. In fact, I'll show you my ALF, okay? I have two. There it is. It looks no more than a paper clip, does it? Right. However, when I teach this stuff, I actually teach the dentist to only treat young people for starters, give the palate, the cranial bones, the support they require for growth and development. 
All credit goes to Derek Nordstrom out in California. He invented these things 40 years ago. Can you find that at Ryan Alf Appliance? His name's Dr. Derek Nord Derek Nordstrom. And is he it, is in California. Is he a dentist or a lab man? He's a dentist, but the guy is, he's one of these brilliant, brilliant fellows that does all his own lab work by himself. He's up till two in the morning, three in the morning, working in his lab, making things. He's an inventor. Absolutely amazing to talk to this fellow. But he runs the ALF interface group that I'm a part of. And we meet every year, talk about advancements. And we study things like traumatic brain injuries and how the ALF can help with alleviating those. Concussion cases, how the ALF can gently re-nudge the bones open, getting better CSF flow, better lymphatic drainage. Venous drainage is critical too. The ALF is an amazing device for all that. And you know, after literally hundreds of hours of training at this, I, I finally feel like I have a good handle on what I can do with this. I actually use it to correct class three malocclusions as well, and crossbites, of course. Wow. So we do a lot wow. with this little thing. So you make you make your own alpha appliances, or do you have a lab do it? Oh hell no! I'm too lazy for that. I don't I don't do much. <laughs> so, so I have my lab do them. And which do I mean? I don't. I wouldn't assume all labs know how to make an alpha appliance. Now we're in the process of working with um, certain laboratories and getting compliance standards. It's, um, I don't know if we can pull it off or not. We're trying, but there's a bunch of labs that say they do alpha appliances and they just don't have a handle on it. I use a guy in Canada uh, at Orthodent Laboratory. Orthodent and Laboratory? Yeah, awesome lab. I've used them for years and we go way back when it comes to these things, but they know exactly what I'm looking for. The solder points have to be just right. It, it takes a lot of finesse, I'll admit. And it's not for everybody, but once you get a handle on this, you really don't go back to the old styles. Um, as an example, I have banned rapid palatal expanders in my office. I haven't done any in 20 years because of this technology. Do you want to hear about that a little bit? Absolutely. Oh, well, all right. I'll step on a few toes. Um, let me just make sure. I give, let me give the proper name. Howard Farron is the guy you want to complain to, not me. My name is Bill Smith, okay? <laughs> because an RPE, the problems with it, it blocks the tongue from po proper posturing. If your tongue does not go to the roof of your mouth for a good seal, you are not able to breathe through your nose. Therefore, you will not have nitric oxide formation in the paranasal sinuses. Nitric oxide is the Molecule of the century, according to Time Magazine, not according to me, but according to Time Magazine. Additionally, if you're an osteopath doctor and you do hands on the patient's skull with an RP in there, there is zero cranial motion, no cranial rhythm, no flowing, no movement like is required. RPEs also slow down lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic drainage was confirmed to exist by University of Virginia Hospital Center a couple of years ago. UVA Hospital Center confirmed there is indeed a lymphatic system in our brains. And if that lymph does not drain at nighttime, it, that directly correlates to ADD, OCD, autoimmune disorders, and Alzheimer's. And again, not me saying this, this is UVA Hospital confirming all these nuances. So if you stick something in there that holds up cranial motion, you're blocking the lymphatics from draining. You might be causing ADD in our children is what I'm telling you. And again, my name is Bill Smith, okay? But Howard, you got to realize, you know what? Going down this path that I've gone down, I really do upset a few people here and there. And I'm sorry that I'm doing that. But I'm, what I'm asking people is go back and learn about these things. It's so important to help your patients get better. The kids, the adults that I see every day, most of them are doing so much better, and some of them aren't. But, hey, for you know, 80% of the time, I feel like we're treating everybody right. So you talked about ADD, OCD, dystonia. Um, yes. T t talk about uh, um, those more, um, ADD, because okay. it, seems like in, um, it seems like so many parents are told from their kid's teacher in uh, grammar school 
the, your little boy's bouncing off the walls. He has ADD. And, and you know, in America, they, they want you to start taking a pill. I mean, America is about big pharma. The United States yes. has 5% of the nearly 8 billion humans on earth. And we take half the prescription pills. That yeah, should be yeah. a red flag. Do you agree? Sure as heck is. Yeah, it really is. These kids that I see all the time, they come to me and they're just they're just jumping off the walls and jumping all over the chairs. They've got headaches and neck aches and back aches and they're jumping all over. They're hurting. They're not sleeping. That's the biggest issue. I think sleep is the really direct correlator with ADD and OCD. And then what happens is you take that little alpha appliance you fit it in the maxilla and mandible. Now the body, the cranial structures have this support system in place. It's like saying, let me put arch supports under your arches to help your entire leg and back system feel better and function better. We all get that, right? Well, very few, few people get the fact that you put an arch support in, an upper and lower support, and these kids thrive. They function better. And when Derek gets lecturing, he starts getting all on, he starts getting a little hyperactive in his lectures saying, what you're doing is you're allowing the epigenetics to express themselves. You're allowing the child to thrive. And I see it all the time in what I do. And the other thing is that these kids are in sympathetic nervous system mode all the time. They're fight or flight. They don't know how to relax or rest or unwind. And you lay the elves in and you see instantly, within weeks, excuse me, instantly, I call it, but weeks or months later, we see very miraculous things start to happen. Uh, just this week alone, two children came in, brother, sister, their headaches are now gone. They've calmed down tremendously. A uh, number of kids, I take care of a, a group from Fort Worth, Texas, of all places, the Fort Worth contingency, we call them. They fly in, we're, they're all getting better. We're fixing class two malocclusions, we're fixing the ADD, the Tourette's has calmed down on another kid, and that's just from Fort Worth. So the kids that I put the ALPS in start to sleep better. Then the ADD calms down because I think they're sleeping better. So it's all connected. So how could that be more preventive? Um, how, how do you, you know, how would you screen children at a younger age to get underneath that so they wouldn't okay. end up there? What we do in my office, we see every single young child at no charge for a fairly thorough examination to start a foundation. We start looking at the frenums, you know, pull back the lips. Are they tongue tied? It's so interesting. A lot of them have been screened by their pediatricians, yet they're tongue tied. And then I don't know if you saw the article the other day about dentists are doing phrenectomies at an all time record high just to make money. Well, I'm the idiot that doesn't make any money off of it because I refer all my phrenectomy cases to an ENT just because if there's a bleeder, I want the MD on top of it. That's just my paranoia, I guess you want to call it that, trying to be safe with kids. But if you can screen these kids early, and I mean two to three years old, look at the frenums, look at the cranial bones. Are they level? Learn to palpate this. Learn to take an x-ray or two. If they're distorted internally, then... I will often just do what are called uh, bite turbos. Are you familiar with that? No. Um, I, Howard, I, I don't have photos of it here, but imagine on the lower ease, you put a little riser or lifter a few millimeters tall so that now the teeth in front don't touch. So what you do is you're taking a high mandibular plane angle. You put a little turbo or build up here on the mandible, and it brings the high mandible down a little bit better thus less TMJ symptoms as they grow older, the sixes will come in taller to better support the TM joints. All the teeth forward of the E's super erupt. So instead of a kid having a super deep bite like that, we do this over time. We gradually open them, open them, and open them. And that's what I do on the little tiny people, the three years old, if they're cooperative. If they're too bouncing off the chair and <laughs> bouncing off the wall, we tell mom and dad, wait, and check them in six months. It kind of sounds like the uh, the Mew technique, the M E A W. Yeah, I noticed in like Taiwan and Japan and uh, Europe, a lot lot of uh, orthodontists are really more concerned with the angle, um, whereas a lot of the Americans uh, do a lot of uh, orthodontic surgery. Uh, um, they you know change the angle. But again, why do you not let, to use the RPE, the rapid palate expander, which is used so much in uh, 
the uh, orthodontist and the pediatric dentist in America? Again, just the basic cranial motion is stopped dead in its, dead in its tracks. Tongue cannot posture properly. You cannot get a proper swallow. All these are factors that are so important, and you're just blocking the children's development when you do these things. You might as well put a vice grip on their maxilla. And I know that's going to stir up a lot of controversy out there, and I'm sorry for that, but it's just the way it is. Once you start with this and you start learning what the ALF can do, you start to realize that maybe, like yesterday, I told the patient, um, yeah, if you want to do jaw surgery, you can, but I'm not going to be part of it because you'll be back in my chair a year later when you're hurting. If you want to do a DNA or something like that, I don't do that. I, I banned all such heavy, heavy items in my practice. No Maras, no twin blocks, unless they're an ALF twin block. We don't want to slow down development. And who is your... Um favorite orthodontic uh, instructor because the one, the one thing the orthodontists have done in America is kept orthodontic education out of the dental schools. When you're yeah. in a dental school, the endodontists have no problem teaching you molar endo. The oral surgeons love to teach you uh, yeah. extractions, the pediatric, every one of the nine specialties will do anything and everything to teach you how to do what they do. Knowing the 80-20 rule, you'll do 80% of it, they'll do 20 until you come to orthodontics. And then in every dental school, they say, well, if you want to learn ortho, you should go to ortho school. It's like, right, right. you know, so, so, um, and whenever an orthodontist starts teaching uh, American general dentists orthodontics, they're m amazingly blackballed from the orthodontic society. Uh, take Richard Litt. He's the only board certified orthodontist. He was the, the teacher at University of California, San Francisco. Then he moved yeah. over to uh, Detroit. And, hell, he, he's never asked to speak anywhere. I mean, orthodontist, I mean, his name is Dirt because he yeah. teaches low life. So who, what low life was teaching you, a mere general dentist, about ortho, and who do you recommend for that? I give a lot of credit to Brock Rondow up in Toronto. Awesome, awesome man. He teaches incredibly excellent orthodontic techniques. The only thing is, when I've attended his courses over the years, he says, look, you know, Jeff, you're the outlier. You do ALFs. You don't do Mara TVs, all these different, all these different positioners. I don't do any of that. And he readily acknowledges that. Then I also would recommend Jay Gerber at the uh, Straight Wire Orthodontic Studies Group. Jay, another, he's again a general dentist that learned heavy-duty orthodontic techniques. A brilliant man who teaches this to the general dentist population. So I've, I've done all the training with these guys imaginable. I really thank them for my orthodontic abilities. And I must admit, I have to do orthodontic work every day. I don't really want to though, Howard, but I have to for severe TMD cases. I have to, I've had to learn how to lift by cuspids and molars and canines, and sometimes as high as 20 millimeters, which we hear that that can't be done. At least that's what I'm told by orthodontists. We do it every day. How does TMD relate to sleep apnea? Okay. When I palpate a patient's head and neck region, I can reach in and grab the lateral pterygoid, which is way up by the second molar. And if that's in spasm, then internally, they're like this. They're tight as a drum. Their throat is constricting. So that's one of the factors. The other thing that I see almost hmm, three-fourths of the time is a calcified stylohyoid ligament running from the mastoid down to the hyoid bone, roughly. And when that thing is calcified, it looks sometimes like my finger does, but it's all bone, all in the neck. That's closing down the airway and the throat, too. That's from, again, postural problems. The patient is often forward head posture like this. And because their discs are out of place, they feel better hanging their heads forward. It's so much more comfortable. So then the neck is irritated, stylohyoids calcify, more and more throat problems, swallowing problems, breathing problems. Again, all connected to those slip discs. You mentioned that, that it was running all the way down to the hyoid bone. That's why the cheetah can't roar, because a cheetah is the cat without a hyoid bone. So all the other cats can roar, but it the cheetah, the fastest running of all the cats, 70 miles an hour, it can just purr like a kitty cat because it doesn't have a hyoid bone. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> That's crazy. That, that is crazy. Um, I want to, um, you know, when you and I were little and uh, 
you got an 86, I was 87. There was a lot of, um, the oral surgeons, they, they were doing a lot of flap surgery on TMJs. They were, I mean, it, it was a common yes. thing. And and remember, yes. it was uh, University of Louisville. Uh, no, uh, um, what, it was New Orleans, down, down in uh, New Orleans, where they had that really famous oral surgeon putting in a lot of artificial disc. And then okay. those discs uh, disintegrated, and God, they were finding macrophages eating parts of that disc and kneecaps and all that kind of stuff. Are you seeing sure. much uh, TMJ surgeries anymore, or artificial condyle joints, or is that kind of a bygone era? Well, a lot of it's a bygone era. The arthrocentesis, for example, where you, you shoot the needle in on the high side and flush it on the low side. Uh, I've talked to my surgeon, Eugene Gregory, wonderful, wonderful guy who does my surgeries. And actually almost every week he does surgeries for me. So yeah, we do surgeries. Um, when you do an arthrocentesis, you generally will perforate the disc with that first needle or the second. So you're damaging the joint anyway. The better approach is go in one inch incision right there at the crease of the ear. He picks up the disc, placates it back where it belongs, 14, 15 stitches front and back to hold it where it belongs. Success rate is 94% of the time. And almost every single patient that comes out, I, like, I had three this week that just are post-op checks. They all said the same thing. I wish I had done this 20 years ago. All the pain Who's is gone. Who's your surgeon doing that? His name is Eugene Gregory in Falls Church, Virginia. He goes way back with me and Dr. Stack. He, he knew Brendan back 40 years ago. The unfortunate thing is Gene is retiring at some point in the near future so I'm trying to negotiate a replacement for him. Hopefully we'll find somebody, and we're working on it now. Does Eugene Gregory have any referrals for that? For, um, to replace him? Yeah. Not right now, no, no. Yeah, Gene is thinking of, um, at first when he, when he knew Brendan, and then he didn't know I was coming on board, he was ready to retire six years ago and just say, that's it, I've had enough. But because of me, he stuck around, and he may stick around a few more years is what we're hoping for because he's got the knowledge base. He's done thousands of joints, and he's written papers, and he's done such a great job with these people. And it's quite a finesse to do TMJ surgery. You will hear mostly negative things on the Internet about this type of surgery. The people just don't know enough about it, and the experience just is not there. As a good example, I had a patient uh, about a year ago, one of our State Department patients, needed surgery. She could only open 10, 12 millimeters. That was it. Locked, couldn't move, months on end. We tried an appliance and we knew she needed surgery. So she said, look, I'm not paying Dr. Gregory's fee, which is out of network for insurance. I'm going to find my own surgeon. So she calls Blue Cross. They got a list of 18 TMJ surgeons is what they gave her. A list of 18 doctors. She called every single one of them. One of them said he had done 10 meniscectomies, which is removal of discs. All the others basically said, haven't heard about it, don't know what you're talking about, don't have any experience. And this is the list of TMJ surgeons that was provided to this patient. So she was disgusted. She ended up having Dr. Gregory do the surgery, and she said, yeah, best thing in the world, I should have done it 30 years ago. So that's our typical story on surgery. Wow. You know, you say you treat TMJ when people who have uh, movement disorders like Tourette's. Um, a far more common movement disorder is uh, Parkinson's. Uh, yes. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's the same thing. I think Parkinson's is just for folks that are a bit older, and the same thing is going on. I, every time I do my MRI, movement disorders show up that the articular discs are tipped in medially or inward. And that's the typical thing that we see, whether you're six years old or 65 years old. It's about the same thing to me. Now, the problem with that is, as we get older and older, those discs, uh, I wrote a blog on this one, Howard. It was, um, it was called something about the case of the French fry that was stuck. So if you think about, you're in the driver's seat of your car, then there's a console to your right where you rest your arm. Well, between the chair and the console is this tiny space. Imagine if that you drop your French fry down in there. It is stuck. It's jammed down in there. Well, if you're young and pliable, you can really reach down, reach down in there, pick up the French fry, like the medially slipped disc. But at, if it's stuck down in there for 50 years, odds are it's calcified. It may have adhered. Things like that happen. 
There is what I see happening with Parkinson's. The medially slipped disc is literally jammed down in there between the chair and the console, and to get it out is darn near impossible. So therefore, Parkinson's doesn't work as well with our treatments. Wow. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah, but I see it all the time, unfortunately. And when I tell the patient, look, you know, your 70 or 80 year old parent has the hands are like this. I think the disc is jammed down in there and the MRI tends to show that almost every time or it's eroded away. So my theory on Parkinson's and, you know, for what y'all want to take it for whatever it's worth, I think that articular disc is jammed down medially between the condyle and all in that tissue, it's been down there eroding for years upon years, sending aberrant signals to the brain through the auriculotemporal nerve or whatever bundles of nerves are getting hit. And it's just stuck and there's no way anyone in the world can get the whole thing back up there again, which is why ter- Parkinson's, excuse me, is so damn difficult to deal with and get a success with. And when I explain this to the patients, they're like, oh, I should have done this 40 years ago. And I say, yeah, I, I, yes, indeed, but you're here now. We do try, but the success rate is so much lower as we get older, as with anything. Now, the most common, um, the most common would be um, headaches and migraines. Do yeah. you do you think? What, what do you think is the? Um, how do you think TMD can treat headaches and migraines? Most of those have anterior or laterally displaced discs almost all the time and again we do the mri uh, i've got a bunch of videos on youtube if you look for them you'll see uh, there's carrie out there that talks about severe migraines she was on tegretol uh, topamax all these other terrible drugs for years on end and we just simply made our appliances and we're now finishing up her case orthodontically we're lifting her teeth to long-term support those tm joints and we're done with, a lot of cases are done like that, but you know, migraines aren't that hard to work with. So you can, you can successfully treat migraines with orthodontic appliance and orthodontics? Um, I don't call them orthodontic. I call them more orthopedic appliances. Orthodontics refers to the, just the tooth itself. And we only manipulate the teeth after we get the discs in place. And as Dr. Stack used to say, once the discs are good, then bring up the pretty little white things to support what you just did. And it's so true. Yeah, that's Brendan's way of describing it. So what would you tell a young child who's 25 years old? She just graduated from dental school, and she says um, she wants to learn more about this. She wants to m- learn more about sleep apnea. And, and the, o- the other thing that concerns me about this, and I want you to address this, it seems like dentistry is – in a way, it's going in the wrong direction because it seems like a very popular dental practicing model is to be a jack of all trades. They they want to do their molar endo and place implants and do sleep apnea and do Invisalign. It's like, gosh, in 1900, there were no specialties and healthcare was 1% of the GDP. At the end of the century, it was 14% of the GDP with 58 mm-hmm. specialties in medicine, nine in dentistry. Now we're at 2018 and healthcare is 17% of the, the economy. And can you really master ortho, TMJ, sleep apnea, molar endo, yeah. placing implants, bone grafting, uh, veneers, cosmetic bleed? I mean, can you really be a jack of all trades or do you really need to kind of, you know, like when someone says to me, Howard, I want to get into sleep medicine. My first question is, okay, what are you going to give up? I mean, what are you going to yes. start referring? And they're like, no. I'm like, dude. Dude, it, it's a full-time job to stay on top of sleep apnea, on TMJ, yeah. on um, molar endo. I mean, look at implants. I mean, bo- yeah. just bone grafting. That field is moving so fast. So what, what do you tell a 25-year-old kid who thinks yeah. she's going to play every single instrument in the orchestra? <laughs> I, I have those discussions frequently, actually. And I tell them, please do not be a jack of all trades. Do not do what I do. I think that's one of the best bits of advice you can get out of the seminar today. Don't do what I do, but learn how to screen for it and identify it. Number one, you check range of motion. You palpate a few bones. Have your hygienist do that. That's fine. But put it in the chart. Range of motion, 28 millimeters, patient advised. 
But that's the best thing you can do right now. The thing is, if you go down this path, like, Howard, I'm in, I'll be very blunt. I'm in my office seven days a week right now. I'm here at 0, 0,500 hours, Monday through Friday, studying MRIs, looking at my frontal and lateral cephs, comparing things, writing notes. There's no other way to do this kind of practice otherwise. You can't just walk in the room and say, oh, Joe, you have a cracked tooth. We need a crown. You can't do that. You have to present the patient about a 45-minute dissertation on their entire condition. Some of them, two or three times this week, I had women in tears. They came here saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. My doctor says it's all in my head. I heard all the time. Been to the neurologist, been to the ENT, been here, been there. And I look at them, and you can instantly tell cranial bones are twisted. It's instant. Then you do the MRI, that's a further backup on what you already believe. Then you do the frontal cephalometric to further confirm what you already know. You pile the information on, then you present it to the patient. You can't like go down the hall and cut a crown prep and then run back in and do a 45 minute consult. And this actually happened yesterday. I had a new patient in who went to the local, a local TMJ person, she said, and she said, he rushed her in and out of there in five minutes, told her to wear an appliance, do this, do that. And she had no idea what was going on. No, they, they never took the time to explain the MRI or explain the x-rays. And I understand if you're in a busy GP practice, you cannot do such things. You can't just take the time. I think I've got the luxury that I was retired for a while. And I just came back in because I wanted to really help people get better. And I think if you're... If you're doing a lot of other stuff, you're not able to focus in on the cranial bones and all the little things like working on different things every day of the week. We're inventing a uh, frenum reduction appliance right now. And you know, if I was busy cutting crowns all day, I wouldn't have time for that. So how much uh, are you focused on sleep medicine, sleep apnea? Well, every single patient that I have has an apneic problem. So it's all, it's all intertwined like this. This is out of place, they don't sleep well, vice versa. So it's all connected. So we're treating the whole picture all at the same time. And I do offer, I will totally admit, when a, when a new patient comes in, they've got a, an order for a sleep appliance, I say, that's fine, I will do that if that's all you wish. Allow me to diagnose what's going on first. Every one of them has an underlying TMJ problem. Every single one of them. So if they want a Narval or whatever they want, I will do it and call it a Band-Aid. It's a temporary thing. However, it will slow down cranial rhythm. It will cause other problems later on. Imagine if the articular discs are anteriorly displaced and you put in a device that brings the jaw down, shoves it forward, you're going to potentially damage those discs. So it may create a TMJ problem. So... Thinking back, well, gee, that's why I took an MRI to understand what I'm dealing with. It's all the cyclical thinking, Howard. You know, it's uh, slip discs. Do you want to put in a device that will jam the jaw forward and bang those discs even further and exacerbate the TMD problem? What percent of people who use a CPAP in America do you think had an MRI? To None. That? Yeah. And what None. percent of the people using a CPAP today do you think if had an MRI would would show some type of DM, a TMD disorder? Probably 80% or so, maybe 90%. That, 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 I mean, that, that is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I, will ha I have to admit, every single patient that's come here for sleep therapy, except for one out of maybe 500 of the past five years, one I did not do an MRI on because there was no indicator whatsoever, but every single other one of them has slipped discs. And, and give us more uh, demographics. Uh, we talked about Tourette's was mostly males between 6 yes. and 40. Um, what, what, what about TMD? TMD is, I'm not sure if it's more prevalent in females. Um, I actually had an interview this morning at 7 a.m. with uh, the Facebook group called Dearly. And um, they asked me, why, why is it mostly women seem to have TMD issues? One, women are more sensitive in general. I don't know if that's the nurturing effect, uh, you know, taking care of the children, being more sensitive. Second reason, women are smarter. That's just the way it is. Women deal with things. Men put things off. 
men are more likely to say, oh, I'll take an Advil because I'm hurting or I'll suck down some alcohol to kill the pain. Women are more likely to deal with issues. And I, I do think that ties into the, the nurturing aspect of being female. And therefore, it makes them smarter and they're going to deal with it more than a male would. Oh, absolutely. Every epidemiologist I've ever talked to said, you know, um, women, when they have a problem, they raise their hand and they go get help. Mm -hmm. And then um, I I uh, had lunch yesterday with an emergency room physician in Phoenix, Arizona, and we we were laughing because every time I talk to an emergency room physician, they say things like, you know, grandpa will come in. And he'll, um, you know, passed out in the grocery store. And it turns out he's had black diarrhea for two years. Oh, and, of wow. course, at that point, ulcerated colon, he's got to have surgery. He's got to have half his colon taken out. Well, women, after they've had black diarrhea for a week, they think, you know, something's not right. Uh, but yeah. the average <laughs> life expectancy in America for a male is 74. Women, it's 79. Women live five years longer because they raise their hand and get help. So... I would assume um, that they that every disease would uh, like like TMD would have a higher incidence of women because women will go ask about their condition, whereas men yes. don't want to be. And they also don't want to. It's so bizarre, and I know it's corny and cliche, but they won't even ask for directions. I mean, you know, older <laughs> men without GPS, and yeah. you're like, you know, could we stop at a gas station, or can we find? Can we, you know, before before they had smartphones. I mean, I notice that all the time. You know, all the women would stop at the gas station and ask for directions, and the men would just drive around aimlessly lost forever because um, they, um, you know, they, um, you know, they, anyway, they're, they're men, and uh, that's amazing. It is so true. Yeah. Yeah, it is so true. Yes. You know, one thing I do want to point out, too, that we all should be aware of, dental extractions, the problems that they cause. Okay. When you yank a tooth out of a person's head, I see every day of the week my new patients coming in. They've had the four on the floor. We're all familiar with that expression. It has taken the upper and lower jaw and done this to it. There's an airway problem ready to happen. You can only survive so many years. If they yank out four bicuspids, they retract your maxilla and mandible to make the orthodontic work easy. I see these patients all the time. They're all compressed back. They can't breathe. It eventually catches up with everybody. On the, on the, okay, I'll go on my theory of wisdom teeth. Uh, when my own daughter, I guess it was three, four years ago, had her wisdom teeth pulled out, she ended up, I put Alf's in for her to give cranial support for the cranial bones. She went to the oral surgeon on a Friday at 12 noon, had four wisdoms out, kept her Alf's in place all weekend, Went to Myrtle Beach with her girlfriends, had a wonderful time, no pain, no swelling whatsoever. Because when you pull wisdom teeth out, you have the four teeth out, you have major holes in your head at that point, 16 square centimeters, by the way, of big holes, everything will collapse. And that will cause major cranial disruption and other problems. So what I'm trying to do nowadays, I'm actually trying to invent a cheap, cheap ALF for surgical cases. So when the wisdom teeth come out, keep that cranial support in place. The problem is ALFs are not cheap. They're thousands of dollars. And ALF is thousands of dollars? Yeah, about 3000 or so. They're like any other, like an orthodontic case would be basically. So it's like, you know, upper lowers, 6000 plus, And it's a lot of work involved making these things. And they're quite expensive. But that's normally the normal fee, I guess, for all over the U.S. for those people that do them. But I would like to invent a cheap version of that to give the support for during the time a patient has wisdom teeth out. So we're kind of working on some ideas on that, too. And imagine just a cheap um, uh, valplast framework or something to hold things in place during the six weeks of healing. Well, the, the cheapest way to treat it would be to prevent it. I mean, it's, it's not even the orthodontist or the oral surgeons. It's the anthropologists that have been telling dentistry for about five years, look, man, we, oh, yeah. we have hominid fossils going back a long time. I mean, at Arizona State University is where they have Lucy, who's 1.6 million years old, and they're saying all these malocclusions, they just showed up in the last century. What exactly. went yeah. wrong? And what went wrong is they were nursing for several years, and they were chewing grit off a mastodon bone, 
And now the minute baby has any difficulty nursing, they switch to some gallon guzzle bottle from uh, uh, Costco with a big old sippy cup. So there's no forces on the face. And then right. they, they feed them baby Jew that's all mush out of a jar. You know, it's like, so, so the baby doesn't fight nursing, uh, doesn't chew anything hard, no forces on its face all through the development. And then people wonder why that 32 teeth don't fit in comfortably. Yeah. And again, this goes back to my ALF treatment with our patients. I now advise my patients, take those ALFs out in the afternoon, nosh on nuts, you know, peanuts, pistachios, almonds, 20 minutes every day. Just a little, little handful is all it takes. And all children should be doing this every single day. We tell kids, do not eat with your ALFs in place. That's just my way of doing things. Everybody's different. But when you take these out, eat hard, gnarly foods, stimulate some development. And we also use things called myo munchies to help with that too. But that's that's a whole other discussion on different appliances. So you ba- so you basically um, are TMD sleep apnea alpha appliances. I mean, do you do root canals, fillings, crowns, hygiene department? Do you t- tell no. us about about the everything else? I have. I okay. My initial consultations with my patients, Howard. I sit in a bar stool. They sit in a bar stool. We face each other like this. I look at the patient. The general dentist goes around the chair and comes around like this and says, hey, Mr. Smith, how you doing? You can't see your patient when you're doing that. So we pull back the hair, look at the eyes, look at the shape of everything, look at the shoulders. If they're like this, they have an internal um, problem with the cervical spine, the whole back is out of place. So I don't have needles in my office. Um, I don't have any regular drill bits, burrs, that type of stuff. No forceps, no um, endodontic equipment. I mean, nothing like that. My days are spent putting acrylic on appliances to lift the condyles out of the sockets or wire benders to bend ALFs. And I only bend these things one-fourth of a millimeter, a quarter of a millimeter at every visit. It's ever so subtle. How often would you uh, see them to adjust it? Four to six weeks, usually. Four to six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what do you do when they have a cavity or a filling or they need general family dentistry done? They have to keep up with their general dentist at all times. Um, that the cleanings, the exams, the fillings. If anyone needs a crown, we try to get all the crowns out of the way before we treat. But that can get in my way too. So uh, when he last this past week, I ordered, I don't know how many patients that have stainless steel crowns. I ordered those off and put into plastic temporary crowns for the children. The adults, very similar too. I want that patient into a lab fab temporary crown made of acrylic that I can grip onto with my orthodontic appliance, my ALF appliance, my whatever I need, or put a ledge there to hold something. So that's the kind of treatment that I would ask of the general dentist is please provide me with something I can work with. I don't want beautiful finished crowns at this time. And what um are the are most of these patients refer to you by the general dentist or do they come to you uh, yeah. directly to you? Are you are you getting B to C referrals, business to consumer, or more B to B business to business from uh, other dentists in the community? We we check our stats on a regular basis, which I recommend all of you guys do. Check your stats every month. But uh, years ago, our we were ninety percent internet referral based by Google. Now we're 51% physician and general dentist referrals. So that's gone up and up and up as time has gone by. And it works out pretty well. I can call, like yesterday, I called a gentleman who referred two patients this week already. And I told the patient, you know, you do have a TMJ disorder. Call your GP dentist back and say, hey, doc, good call. You sent him to the right place. And that gives support for the, the general dentist to realize that he or she made the right referral and then I send the information to them through what's called Dental Writer, and that's the program that I use. Uh, is it with a W, Dental Writer with a W? Correct, yeah. Spelled okay. properly. Okay. And the uh, people we've used, Brendan actually developed the program with Rose Nierman many right, years ago. in Florida. Okay, yeah. And uh, we talk, I see Rose and her people at the different meetings, and we talk and say hi, and they ask how Brendan's doing, of course. So, um where we keep in touch with these folks. We use their program literally two, three, four times a day on the new patients. But the issue is that it does not integrate into Dentrix or Open Dental or whatever your platform is. 
So you have to keep everything separate. And then another unfortunate thing is the x-rays do not integrate or bridge. So I run three or four separate programs at any one time on every single patient. Try manage, managing that as a general dentist. That is very difficult to do. And that's why you really want to have systems that are open because, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of closed systems uh, like, like Dentslice Serona, CAD CAM, Sarah Galeos, that's notoriously uh, a closed yes. system. And, um, and so that's why uh, these are important. Um, so when you were 90% internet, um, tell us your marketing on the internet that was so successful. Well, and I'll start off way back when I met Brendan. I got on Facebook and mostly out of frustration, I would be seeing these, I'll be very blunt, dumbass comments like, um, okay, this week's dumbass comment was surgery first. It is a group that does, um, I think what they do is they do a maxillary advancement. They do a Lafort sliding osteotomy on the mandible. They do that before doing anything else for these patients. Lock them in tight, braces sealed shut. And I'm thinking that's about as idiotic as it gets because you're totally changing the relationship of the condyle to the articular discs. No analysis of the TM joint is being done with these cases. So once again, I got on my podium and I responded back to somebody asking me about this. My response to doing that kind of surgery was, hell no, you're stupid if you do it. Now, Brendan would have said it in much more harsh words, as you know. I'm being as nice as I possibly can and trying to explain the... I'm sorry, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You shouldn't be doing that. And literally three hours ago, another patient was here. He's thinking of having his class three malocclusion corrected surgically. We had a good talk about it. He has crepitus in his left joint. That sounds like potato chips crunching up in there. So we have a seriously blown disc. Do you want to run that maxilla forward with a seriously blown out disc? It doesn't work. So when he heard that, he said, well, I went to all these other doctors last month or so. No one told me about any of this. And that currently is the state of the art, I'm afraid. Uh, no one had ordered an MRI until he came over here. And how much does an MRI usually cost? Well, it's uh, 1690 billed to insurance. If you do not have insurance and you call our imaging center, they knock $1,100 off that. So cash price is like four ninety five. dollars Wow. Um. Does there, does their medical insurance usually pay for that? Can you can yeah, a most of the time. Di can a dentist diagnose that and get the medical insurance to pay for the MRI, or do you send them to their physician to order it? How does that work? I write the orders myself. Um, I know what I want. I order um, a very specific MRI, Tesla coil, dedicated Tesla coil. In addition, we look for hemorrhagic anomalies, brain bleeds, concussions. Very, very important, I think. One of the final things I order is the angular, uh, condylar angulation to the central axis. So if you're contemplating a surgical case for this patient and their condyles that should be like this, one's like this, it's like saying the front end alignment of your car is so far off, we dare not put new tires on. So we never do surgery on cases like that. And even after a year of doing conservative therapy, if the condyles are so far out of angulation with each other, you know that the discs won't run on top like this. They're running, one's running like this, one's running this way, and the patient will function that way. You'll rub the discs right off in a couple of years. So you inform the patient, and you do the best you can with sometimes with what you have, and that's it. Now, would you, would you call yourself a holistic dentist? No. Nope. Um, what, what do you, um, the, con it, it, it's kind of, uh, if you're against surgery yes. or don't like surgery, kind of, I know, I know it's a very broad term and, and it is, naturopath, yeah. let's see, but it's, it's kind of bizarre because like dentist, um, their knee jerk reaction is I don't like holistic dentists, naturopaths. I don't want anything to do with them. But then right. when they go to the doctor and the doctor says, Oh dude, you have uh, high blood pressure. You need to take a pill. They're like, no, I'm going to, no. Uh, you're, you have high cholesterol. You need to take a statin. And they're like, no, I'll pass. Uh, you, you have erectile dysfunction. You need to take a pill. Oh, I'll pass. The dentist is all against it until it happens to him. Then he's like, right. dude, I need to change my diet. I need to start exercising. I need to join a gym. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You sound like one of those holistic alternative dentists. So when, so when you say 
that you know that you're you're not surgery first the the consumers would call that kind of holistic i mean if you're Maybe, first yeah. if you're i mean it goes all the way back to the medicine man for the last two million years every time you had an ache or a pain you go to the medicine man and he'd either make a lotion or potion and and do a dance or take a knife right. and cut something off and cutting something off surgery and a lotion or potion polyphagia is still going on even though you had geniuses like thomas edison said uh, you know the ultimate medicine was the food that you ate and you, and uh so so when you try to treat things by diet and exercise you're kind of holistic mm -hmm. and i want to say one thing in marketing that if you're a dentist out there you might think all oh, that's witchcraft but dentists who add oh. the words holistic on their website they swear by it. hell there's one dentist in san francisco that all he did was got his dental office off the grid with solar power and he has people mm -hmm. driving an hour away across san francisco burning petroleum uh to go <laughs> to his office because they just figure that that's a doctor they can relate with and you can do yeah, that, like that and and well we can actually do it in arizona i don't know why i haven't done it because in arizona I can pay more for my electricity from the solar farms. So I could actually start, start advertising that, that today's dental is ran 100% off solar because I was going to get solar panels on the roof because we're in the desert. But when the solar guy came out, he said, I, I don't recommend solar panels because you haven't done one thing right under <laughs> inside. Like when you leave the room, the lights would automatically come off. He says, I have the wrong yes. light bulbs. He said, I would take all that solar money and, and redo what's right. Because right now you're using so much electricity, your 4,000 square foot buildings roof couldn't capture enough solar to even run it. So if you spent that money right. down underneath the roof, you could cut your consumption in half. And then mm -hmm. the solar panel would work. But uh, so again, the question, if you're not surgery yeah. first, are you holistic? Are you a naturopath? Well, I only can argue that, and it, this is so funny you mentioned this, this happening in yesterday, These, this new family said, are you a holistic doctor? I said, not really, because all I'm doing is I'm spotting that you have a slip disc. I've identified it. I've proven it. It's not just my thoughts. It is my radiologist confirming this too. So I'm like the guy that says, ma'am, you've got a broken bone here. Why don't we set it with a cast? It's logical. It's documentable. And as I say, there's not much holistic stuff here that we're talking about. This is reality and fact. So if I want to talk holistic, I would be talking about, well, maybe that slip disc is pinching this nerve or interrupting the vertebral artery flow at C1 level. Maybe that's what the holistic guy would say, but I'm just saying, hey, you've got a slip disc. I'm kind of simple, you know, Howard. I'm not, not the smartest uh, stick in the bunch as far as I'm concerned. I just kind of know what I'm doing with this stuff, and I see slip discs. I see distorted bones that are bent bones, okay? I show that to the patients. They see it. I see it. We fix it. Real simple approach, really. Well, our brand is an hour. We're already at an hour and seven minutes. It's so fun <laughs> to talk to you. I love technology. I love the fact that I can't believe you're outside of Washington, D.C. I'm inside of Phoenix where, I mean, it takes me four hours to fly to where you're at. Uh, this yeah. is just an amazing technology. Were there any questions I wasn't smart enough to ask? Uh, no, sir. I think you've done, you've done a great job in asking the questions. This is such a misunderstood field. You seem to have a really good handle on what's going on and the confusions out there. So I appreciate it. Well, it's dentistry uncensored. I don't want to talk about anything anyone agrees on. I mean, uh, you know, they, there's plenty of places to go learn about stuff that, you know, um, that no one disagrees on. I like to get to the heart of the story. And the heart of the story is um, why are the same diseases treated differently? For instance, again, orthopedic mm -hmm. surgery. Why did the Taiwanese um, use tilting the, the maxilla and the mandible, whereas the Americans are first to do a Lafort osteotomy surgery? You know, so, so let, let's yeah. talk about that. I love TMD um, because there are so many different camps. Uh, it's, yes. uh, it's pretty boring to do a podcast on a GV Black prep. I mean, you that, but, uh, but I want to thank you. I know you're a busy man. Guy, you get to work every morning at 5 a.m. And you yeah. actually gave uh, uh, me an hour of your time, an hour of your life. I really, really appreciate it, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you're you welcome. so much for coming on the show today and talking to my homies. 
You're very, very welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Enjoy the sun. We don't have much sun here, as you can see in my background. Well, that's it's a been beautiful like this background. All week. It looks like a, it looks like you're in the Amazon rainforest. Well, actually, if I turn left, I'm looking at Interstate 495, the Beltway around DC. And um, one of these days, I'm hoping I, I can be a weather forecaster too, and just report from my office. You know. <laughs> well, actually, if you want to be a weather forecaster, anybody can do it in Phoenix because it's just clear skies and sunny about 395 days a year. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't even know if you'd have to go to school to be a meteorologist in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. It's nothing for them to give a 10-day forecast and be right. But uh, on right. that note, have a great weekend. You too. Thank you very much.